Okay, I was going to have a uh, pool to see whether or not I could actually make this work this time, and hopefully it, it is going to work. Today we're going to talk about persistent infections. And um, they're really of interest because all of us are infected with something all of the time. And the question that is really important here is why? What permits that? What is it about the relationship between a virus and its host? that allows these guys to um, lay in wait. Now, for those of you who are old enough to remember this, that would be one person in the audience. There's a song from Neil Sedaka in 1962, Breaking Up is Hard to Do. And that's really the theme of what we're going to talk about. Why is it that these viruses get in? How do they come out? What are the various um, machineries that they access? How do they get access to them? How do they avoid the host? So we've talked about DNA replication, and we've talked about transcription, and we've talked about how viruses avoid the host. And all of those are seminal things to understanding something about persistence and latency. And that's what I'm going to try and address today. So one of the first things to differentiate between is an acute infection, one that is ongoing and happening, and a persistent infection, which can take many different forms. An acute infection is a naturally occurring infection that is usually rapid and self-limiting. Think of a cold. You get sick, your nose runs, you get better most of the time. But persistent infections are different. And they can the be the result of a natural infection that's very long term. That is the virus's replication cycle, its access to the host, and its period of time before it manifests itself in the host can be extremely slow. In some cases, the infections are abortive. So the virus doesn't run through its complete infection cycle, rather it's an abbreviated infection cycle. And in that case, it's either because the infected cell has been cleared or because the virus is not capable of, rec of recognizing host machinery, machinery in the milieu in which it's set. sometimes the virus becomes latent. And under those conditions, the virus establishes itself within a host cell and does very little. It's sort of on vacation, if you will. So it's not making a lot of gene products. It's not expressing a lot of proteins because if it were to express many proteins, the host for sure, or for the most part, would recognize that infected cell and remove it. Frequently, however, latency is a manifestation not just of the virus itself and what it's done, its failure, but the kind of cell in which it sits. So a cell that is not actively replicating doesn't provide a lot of machinery for the virus. And unless the virus has a mechanism to activate that machinery, that cell will not provide the right environment. And finally, we have the kinds of infections that we call transforming. That is where a virus alters the host, changes it such that it has some sort of oncogenic potential. And I'll touch on this a little bit with human papillomaviruses and a human polyomavirus that is called Merkel cell carcinoma. And Dr. Racaniello will go into it in a little bit more detail uh, later on. Now, these are the kinds of patterns that one sees when one is infected. And it's important to differentiate between the acute infection, the one that's seen normally with rhinoviruses, the source of colds, rotaviruses, the guys that give you gastrointestinal distress, and influenza viruses, the ones that everybody worries about um, because 1918 is going to come again, or so they think. So those are acute infections. Virus gets in, it replicates, you have symptoms, virus is cleared in response to antibody, in response to innate immunity. Then there are persistent infections where things smolder. That is, it takes a very, very long time for the virus, uh, for the effects of the virus infection to manifest themselves within the host. So someone is infected. This turns out to be a mouse virus, but there are um, human viruses that are similar. And over a very long period of time, the virus replicates very, very slowly in the host. And then at some period, it actually manifests itself, and frequently it's uh, in the form of death. 
Recrudescence, which is this wave, this series of waves of infection, is most often seen with a persistent infection, such as herpes simplex virus. And we've touched on this before, but people who are infected with herpes, 85% of you, will frequently get or infrequently get cold sores. Better if you infrequently get them. Um, but there are apparent infections and inapparent infections where the virus is shed with no overt lesion. But virus is replicating. And again, we'll get to that to some degree because it's a very interesting situation. And it's not too dissimilar from chicken pox and shingles. Shingles is called the second coming of, sh of chicken pox. The major difference, which we'll talk about later, is the frequency of those reactivations. And finally, there are a bunch of very bizarre persistent infections which are very slow. One of them is called a measles virus subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. And what it results in is brain damage to those who are infected. And it results from the virus infecting the host, but because of host antibodies, only cells that produce certain virus proteins are permitted to proceed. And cells don't fuse the way they normally do with measles virus. So one of the hallmarks of measles virus infection that Dr. Racaniello has shown you is the fact that cells fuse, membranes fuse. But the antibodies prevent that. And as a result of that, some very bizarre things happen. And there is a tendency to select for only portions of the virus genome in those cells. So that's pretty cool. It's not cool if you get it, but it's interesting otherwise. Um, HIV is a virus like this, where it sits and it sits and it sits. And you can pretty much clear it out of the system, except that there are some cells that protect the virus because they don't replicate. They're in uh, certain areas of the body that seem to be recalcitrant to uh, drug treatment, and then the virus comes back up. So we can suppress it, it'll reactivate, we can suppress it again, but over a long period of time, there are certainly sequelae. And another retrovirus, the human T lymphotropic virus, which was the first, um, I guess it's the first human retrovirus that was shown to have adverse effects. Not the first human tumor virus, because that was Epstein-Barr virus. Okay, so how do viruses avoid the host? They do it by being smarter than the host. Actually, they do it because they have lousy enzymes to replicate their genomes. And as a result of that, they make frequent mistakes. And there is modification of proteins that are elaborated by these viruses. So if the host can exert selective pressure by synthesizing antibody that will recognize the virus, then what can happen is the viruses that survive are those that are resistant to clearing. So the antibody that's made in the first wave of infection doesn't get all of them for some reason, or the cell-mediated response doesn't get the rest of them, and some viruses survive, and they have altered coats or altered envelopes, and therefore they're resistant to clearing. And this is, occurs as a result of antigenic shift small changes in the proteins because of mutation. Different from what happens in flu where you have recombination between um, genome segments and that's called antigenic shift and that'll be touched on again later. And as a result of that, the host allows for selection of viruses that can avoid the immune system. So, why do persistent infections occur? Well, the primary infection is not cleared. And that's primarily because of either a not-so-robust response or because the virus can change a little bit. And under these conditions, for example, with poliovirus, the virus can persist for years. And it gets um, spread by uh, fecal contamination. Now, in the other case, we have what are called chronic versus latent infections. And I think of HIV as more of a chronic infection because it persists in a rather overt form. It's very rare that the number of virus genomes actually disappears, except in a few very unusual um, hosts. And they're different from latent infections, which persist for a lifetime. And they persist for the most part because they are not making new virus particles. But for a virus infection to be called a latent infection, it has to be reactivatable. If you're a virus and you infect somebody, and you're there for a long time, and the host dies and you haven't reactivated, you haven't gotten a chance to spread the wealth. 
So that's sort of counterproductive for a virus. So what are the general properties of latently infected cells? First is gene products that are involved in replication, transcription, or DNA replication, are usually not made. And if they are made, they're made as a subset of the ones that are normally required. An Epstein-Barr virus does that. Those of you who have had infectious mononucleosis are familiar with Epstein-Barr virus. There are other uh, diseases that it's involved with, and we'll talk about those. Sometimes the proteins are found in extremely low concentrations, another way to effectively remove it from uh, replication. And sometimes the proteins that are made that are important for regulating the virus genome are in the wrong place. So the proteins are made, but because host or virus enzymes are not made at the right time or not made because you're in an unusual cell type, maybe they're not phosphorylated, maybe they're not acetylated, maybe they're not present in the nucleus, or maybe they're not present in the cytoplasm. So it's the right thing at the wrong moment. And as a result of that, you don't see replication. Sometimes cells with latent geno genomes are masked from immune surveillance. So there are proteins that are made by the infecting virus, but these proteins are not put on the cell surface. And they're not put on the cell surface because sometimes the viruses are restricting MHC1 presentation. And we've discussed that in some detail. In other cases, the proteins that are put on the cell surface find a way to weave themselves into the matrix of the plasma membrane so that they're unrecognizable. They're essentially hidden. Now, viral genomes persist intact, and they persist intact to reactivate. If only a portion of the viral genome is present, then the virus won't reactivate. Well, that's perhaps a little bit too glib. If any of the major things that are involved in replication are altered or removed, then they won't replicate. As a result of that, it can't spread to a new ho host, and the exception is measles and SSPE, which is this fulminant disease that results from cells infecting each other, not with genomes, but with portions of genomes and their gene products. So examples of latent infections, the one that I'm going to focus on to a, a, la a large extent is Epstein-Barr virus. It has, in the case of latently infected cells, a novel transcription pattern and replication pattern. And the reason for that is the virus, when it comes into a cell, will circularize. And that circular genome is just like a plasmid in a bacterium. And it replicates with the host. So although one or two or three Epstein-Barr virus proteins are made, their purpose is to control replication of this genome with the host as the host divides its DNA or replicates its DNA and cells divide. In latently infected cells, there's no new virus. So this virus persists as uh, B lymphocytes replicate. And as I said before, the genome replicates coordinately with its host. Adenoviruses, responsible for the common cold, can be isolated from lymphoid tissues, adenoids, adenoids, and tonsils from people who are apparently healthy and who have been infected with adeno. The interesting thing is that when you take these cells out of uh, a person, the cultured lymphocytes don't support efficient replication. So there's some block in the host cell that prevents these viruses from replicating well. You can, on occasion, get very small amounts of virus out, but anybody who's infected under that condition has had an antibody response, and that probably helps to suppress um, virus replication and also eliminate those cells that are infected in elaborating virus antigens. Now, this list is from your book. Um, it's just here to pay, so that you'll pay attention to the various kinds of cell types that are involved in establishing persistent infections. So they can be lymphocytes, tonsils and adenoids, for Epstein-Barr virus, they can be B cells, nasopharyngeal epithelium. So in southeast China, there is an epidemic of nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which is caused by Epstein-Barr virus. And why that virus causes an um, epidermal cell cancer in that area, 
versus something called Burkitt's lymphoma, which is a lymphoma in Africa, is really still unclear after 20 years of um, investigating it. Human cytomegalovirus will infect kidneys, salivary glands, lymphocytes, macrophages, stem cells, stromal cells. It's found in breast milk, it's found in semen, it's just everywhere and it's easily uh, transmitted and is a major problem in transplant. So people get transplanted, the transplant tissue is surveyed for the presence of CMV antibody, um, but it's very hard to detect cells that are infected with CMV. And you know that the hepatitis viruses are involved in uh, infecting and being latent in liver cells. So there are a wide variety of different parts of the body, including the central nervous system, where viruses can become resident, be happy, live uh, for the life of the individual, and perpetuate themselves. Now, how do you promote persistence? Well, the best way to do it is to hide, is to keep the immune system from recognizing infected cells. And under those conditions where the host is not the best, but the virus can replicate to some extent, it then, it then avoids the immune system. The other thing that's important, and we've talked about this before, is blocking apoptosis. If the virus is replicating in the cell and it triggers apoptosis, then that cell is going to lyse. And it can lyse before the virus completes its replication cycle. In that case, it not only isn't establishing a latent infection, it isn't completing its replication cycle. Now, what are the host's con contributions to persistence? And here it's interesting to think about some of the targets that are infected. So people get herpes infections of the eye or adenovirus infections of the eye. And one of the reasons that these infections are uh, successful and persistent infections are established is because the eye tissue is devoid of initiators and infectors of the immune system. So unless cells actually come in and migrate to the eye, um, the virus will avoid that. Of course, you also have a lot of people that are uh, blind as a result of cytomegalovirus infections that were not treated. It's very treatable, though, with just topical antiviral agents. So the other reason is that a vigorous immune system or response would destroy the tissue of the eye. The same is true of neurons. So these are cells, the neurons certainly cells that don't divide. Within the eye, there are a whole host of cells. If you're in the conjunctiva and you're um, involved with the lens, and those cells are not dividing very often or, or if at all. And the immune system has trouble reaching those cells. So persistent infection of these organs is therefore relatively common, specifically the neurons. It's important to think about what's going on with the virus genetic information. Is it being replicated? Is it part and parcel replicating with the host? Is it chromosomal? Is it extra chromosomal? And that varies, of course, with the virus. Now, herpes simplex virus and varicella zoster virus, both herpes viruses, persist in neurons. Neurons are non-dividing cells. So the virus establishes itself in those cells, and it doesn't replicate. But curiously, it establishes, its, establishes itself at a relatively high level, not one or two copies of DNA, but 50 to 100. And that suggests that the virus has undergone some kind of replication. What stops it from completing that replication cycle and killing the cell is um, a mystery. Here's a whole bunch of viruses, human papillomaviruses, DNA virus, um, human um, hepatitis C virus, hepatitis B virus, RNA virus, DNA virus, Epstein-Barr virus, a large DNA virus, and the Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus, another gamma, what's called a gamma herpes virus. All of these guys replicate their chromosomes with the host. So they have found a way to coexist and perpetuate themselves. In some cases, however, the virus is found to integrate its chromosome into the host. And under that condition, its replication is obviously controlled by the host. So each time that host chromosome is duplicated and the cell divides, that virus genome is uh, dividing and duplicating. What's critical for these viruses, the parvoviruses, and human herpes virus 6, 
which causes a rather benign illness of children <coughs> called exanthem subitum, which is a horrible red rash all over their face, and then they're better in five days. But the virus stays with you, and the virus is present in lymphocytes. And what this virus does is uses sequences within its genome, and I'll show you that later, to direct where it goes into the host. But because of the way these two guys integrate their genomes, they can come out. They can be excised. So integration isn't a, a dead end in this case. That's not true with the human papillomaviruses. Virtually all of them that undergo integration events are part and parcel of the host, and they can't come out. Sometimes they're part and parcel of the host with get grave consequences. OK, I want to go through a few examples of very curious infections. And uh, we won't go into them in any great detail. But I just want to point out some um, interesting properties. So here we have Synbis virus. And the interesting thing here is that you can infect adult mice. You inject it directly into the brain. The mouse survives. And you get a persistent non-cytopathic infection. So the virus is there and no damage is caused to the host. On the other hand, if you infect a neonatal mouse, so just born, its immune system, remember, is not fully developed at this point. So now we're looking at what's essentially a developmental block in terms of immune response. It's one of the reasons that mammals nurse, because they get antibodies and some uh, T cells from the mother. In that case, the same injection results in a lethal infection. And the reason for it is that the neonatal neurons lack proteins that block virus-induced apoptosis. So the virus goes in, and it actually destroys the cells in the brain. And there's no immune response to clear those cells. Virus gets in, replicates, kills. <laughs> Whoops, what did we do? Okay. Um, this is an example of uh, bovine diarrhea virus. It's a pestivirus. And it has two strains of virus, one that's cytopathic and one that's non-cytopathic. So one causes cell and tissue damage, and the other doesn't. It just gets in there and it replicates. And if animals are infected in utero with a non-cytopathic virus, then those cattle have a lifelong infection. So the virus persists in these animals. There's no detectable antibody or T cell response to virus antigens. So they've managed to tolerate the animal. That is, the animal doesn't recognize the virus antigens as foreign, sees it as self, and doesn't uh, effectively kill virus-infected cells. On the other hand, when infected with the cytopathic virus, that activates the interferon response, and the virus is readily cleared. So two different things, viruses that have really very, very, very similar genomes, slight differences in um, certain virus gene products, and that leads to this amazingly different response by the host. Now, we've mentioned measles. You know that measles is a paramyxovirus. And again, I'm just going to introduce you to subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which is an infection that results from abortive infection by measles. Measles should have been eradicated years ago. Humans are the only host. And because of the scares with um, uh, vaccination and potential sequelae from vaccination, people stopped vaccinating with uh, many different kinds of vaccines. But the other thing is that for some reason, many of the measles vaccines aren't lifelong in terms of protection. So, and you'll find that with some vaccines, you need to be vaccinated over again. And you wonder, what happens? Why is that? Why don't the memory cells work? I don't have any answers for that. But it's an interesting problem. So, there's no animal reservoir for measles. You are the reservoir. It's extremely contagious, easily spread across a room. There are some 40 million infections a year. And it results in systemic immunosuppression. So, you're not able to respond as well. 
but when you're infected naturally, you have lifelong immunity. Once again, pointing out the difference between uh, vaccination, which results from injection in a spot where you don't normally get infected. And so there is certainly something different about the way that those infections occur. So if you look at the virus, it has an RNA genome and all these wonderful glycoproteins that surround it. And in the primary infection, you get these giant cells and infected cells. And that's as a result of cells fusing one to another. So they become multinucleated giant cells. It's sort of like a bad science movie. All right? If you look at a microscope at these things, it's like eyes staring back at you. And you can't see the membrane of individual cells. It's very cool. Um, as a result of that, you get a primary viremia. That means the virus spreads throughout the body from the primary infection. And it spreads to the reticuloendothelial system, and that results in virus shedding. The shed virus now seeds other organs for a secondary viremia, and you begin to get epithelial necrosis, disease, and coplic spots. Coplic spots are little uh, spots that appear as rashes on the body, primarily also in the tongue, and they're a result of having spread the virus throughout the body. And that's a normal course of disease. You get incubation, a prodromal syndrome, that is before the infection manifests itself, the rash, and by the way, anytime you see a rash, it's too late, it's already happened, for the most part, all right? And recovery. And then you have these rare complications where the virus infects the central nervous system, and there's some instances of encephalitis, and the other one is this instance of subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which is a, another kind of encephalitis, but one that persists uh, for the life of the individual until they die. So here's the SSP hypothesis. Measles enters the brain in infected lymphocytes. So lymphocytes are a carrier organ in this capacity. Antibody blocks cell-cell fusion. So that tells you that you've had an immune response. And because the virus is slow, because the virus undergoes two viremias, you have a chance to actually have an immune response. The antibody results in selection of cells from which the fusion protein has been removed. So only a portion of the virus genome actually persists under these conditions. And that results in a slow infection, not a persistent infection. And it's not really persistent because no virus is being made. These are subviral particles. There are very low levels of antibody, and the nuclear protein complexes spread from cell to cell. And the nuclear protein complexes are the complexes that are responsible for replicating what's left of the genome and for helping them transcribe that information. This is a disease that takes six to eight years to manifest itself. So it occurs a long time after the um, initial infection, and it tells you how slowly this goes and how long it takes for replication uh, to proceed. Now, um, this is my herpes virus latency primer. There are three different kinds of herpes viruses, alpha, beta, and gamma. The alpha virus is known to you as herpes simplex virus, and varicella zoster virus are neurotropic. Their primary route of infection is epithelial cells, and we'll go into that in a little detail in a bit. But when they go latent, they go latent in neurons, either in the ganglia, well, primarily in the ganglia. Beta herpes viruses, such as cytomegalovirus and human herpes virus 6, infect many different cell types. But when they are latent, they prefer cells of lymphoid origin, macrophages, monocytes, some stem cells, and their default pathway, like the alpha herpes virus, is lytic infection. Go in, infect, do something, run and hide, make yourself at home. On the other hand, the gamma herpes viruses are markedly lymphotropic. I've already told you about MPC, and I'm going to tell you about Burkitt's lymphoma to a, little, to a small extent, but their default pathway is not a lytic infection. It's a latent infection. So they go in, they find a host cell, they replicate, they establish their genomes and replicate them in the cell. And we'll go through this in uh, boring detail later because it's an interesting uh, situation. 
So uh, let's start with uh, what controls latent virus genomes. And I've tried to extract from uh, hundreds of pages of manuscripts and whatever some of the salient points that are important to recognize. And that is, let's start with herpes simplex virus. Herpes simplex virus elaborates a series of transcripts called the latency associated transcripts that are derived from a single region of the virus chromosome. And they run antisense to a major activating protein. So that's one way in which you can think of how they might modulate infection by producing an antisense RNA that removes uh, the activating protein from doing what it might do. But they do other things too. They make microRNAs. And these microRNAs have targets both in the host and in the virus. And they effectively, or are thought to effectively, um, inhibit latency. And the reason we say that is that viruses that are devoid of either LAT, the region that encodes LAT, or the microRNAs find it very difficult to establish latency in model systems. Varicella zoster virus is thought to express a small number of virus proteins that are actively um, made in infected ganglia but are in the wrong place. They happen to be proteins that are required to be in the nucleus for the virus to replicate but are found in the cytoplasm. And why they don't go to the nucleus is a bit of a mystery. Epstein-Barr virus has three different kinds of latency. And we're not going to go into that uh, in great detail, but it's nice to know that there are uh, different types of latency because they occur in different cell types. And depending upon which kind of latency it is, virus proteins are made always something called EBNA, Epstein-Barr virus nuclear antigen, and several small viral RNAs are synthesized. And they're required to maintain the latent state. They're what helps the virus establish episomal replication. And they also modulate the host response. So they can turn the host uh, immune system off. Human cytomegalovirus and Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus make microRNAs that are thought to play an important role in establishment of latency. And we know that because they've been deleted in model systems which are as good as any model system, that is all it is is a model, uh, the viruses are unable to efficiently establish latency in those cells. So how do you get cytomegalovirus? Any way you want, all right? So it is a virus that can come in through the oropharynx, through the eyes. It's present in genital secretions and breast milk. You can all figure out how that works. And it's also sexually transmitted. And so one of the major problems in um, probably in the 90s was when daycare centers began to proliferate because uh, you had two working parents, there was tremendous spread of this virus amongst kids because little kids have lots of nasal secretions and God knows what else, and they get splattered all over the wall, and they easily contaminated each other all over the place. Usually this is a pretty benign infection. In neonates, however, it's very, uh, uh, very, very bad. and causes a lot of different problems, including deafness, um, poor development and whatever. So HCMV initially infects epithelial and other cell types. Usually because of the portal of entry, it's going to find epithelial cells first. Most infections, as I said, are subclinical. And in fact, most infections with viruses are subclinical. You don't usually manifest an infection that's visible, but rather it's something that's invisible. And that's good. That means your immune system is working. Cell-mediated immunity is required for resolution of the infection. So you must generate um, an active T-cell response. When these viruses do establish a latent infection, it's in bone marrow progenitors and macrophages. So cells of the lymphoid system, as I told you before. And if you repress cell-mediated immunity, you get recurrence. And this is the problem with transplantation. So when you have somebody who gets an organ transplant, those cells are generally, uh, those organs are generally flushed of lymphocytes and any other uh, circulating blood cells. And it's hard to get them all out because there are lots of places to hide. And the patient then gets their immune system suppressed to accept the graft. And under those conditions, 
cells that have cytomegalovirus in the donor organ are able to reactivate. Okay. Um, I told you before, infection in utero can be devastating, and the virus crosses the placenta, so that's an issue. Less so in early childhood, although those kids who get infected from these uh, large studies, the virus persists, and we know that, and it's found in all of these different tissues. Reactivation is a problem. Blood transfusion, all blood is screened for HCMV and in organ donations. And we now know that these microRNAs that are expressed by CMV, both in vitro in the laboratory and in vivo, both in animal models and in people, are very interesting because they're tissue specific. So depending upon the organ that's infected, different microRNAs are elaborated. And they also have different effects. And that's a very interesting uh, evolutionary problem for the virus and the host. How do you find a place to be and survive successfully without killing your host. And they are also associated with a specific stage of virus infection. So at certain points in the life cycle, different microRNAs are made. So there must be some reason for this um, really elaborate uh, vir virus anti-host effect. Now, the first rule of latency. Without reactivation, there is no latency. Commit this one to memory. Okay, that's really important. If the virus doesn't reactivate, then it's not a latent infection. That means that it's some sort of an abortive infection where the virus does not have the potential to propagate itself again. Without reactivation, there's no advantage as the virus can no longer spread. It becomes a dead end. So that's why reactivation is important for the virus. It has to be in um, <coughs> a state where it can replicate and produce new virus particles. So let's come back to herpes simplex virus. As I said to you, greater than 80% of you have antibody to herpes simplex virus. If you were to give me your neural ganglia, your dorsal root ganglia, and I know none of you want to do that, we could get virus out of that. We could reactivate it. Um, 40 million people a year in the United States will um, experience a recurrence, either as a cold sore, in the oral cavity or in the genital area. Those viruses are highly, highly contagious, but only by touch for the most part. Maybe a little bit of aerosol, but for the most part, that's the way it goes. But there is this asymptomatic shedding where there are no overt lesions. So people who know that they're um, herpes simplex virus positive uh, on occasion need to be very careful about what they're doing and when they're doing it. So um, you figure that out, huh? Okay, so the virus can infect both sympathetic and sensory neurons, and it does it pretty much in the same way. It enters through epithelial lesions, replicates in the epithelial cells and the fibroblasts that are underneath the epidermis, so both the dermis and the epidermis are infected. It then finds um, dendrites at the end of neurons, goes up the axon, infects the cell body, and sets up a latent infection. As I said to you before, it's rather amazing that there are multiple virus genomes there. In every other instance that we know about, when this virus replicates its DNA, it kills the host cell. The other thing that's amazing is that, for the most part, spread to adjacent cells is extremely limited. So if you look at a field of cells taken from a neural ganglia, and you stain them for herpes virus genomes by hybridization, you'll find that they're scattered. They're frequently not adjacent to one another. But they're in the same ganglion, which tells you that they found dendrites that innervate that area. The sympathetic uh, nervous system is infected in a slightly different manner because what happens is it results from infection of uh, epithelial, uh, endothelial cells that line vessels and stuff, but they find their way back to the ganglion as well. Now, what are the post-infection events in neurons? The nucleocapsid travels up the axon, not the virus, all right? All you have left is the nucleocapsid. And in this case, that protein that's responsible for activation that we talked about, VP16, is not a passenger. It doesn't go up the axon as well. And that may be one of the reasons that there's very limited production of virus because you don't have a way 
to initiate a vigorous virus infection. Limited productive infection occurs in uh, the neurons, and there is some local inf inflammation that's taken care of by astrocytes for the most part. Astrocytes are sort of, uh, astrocytes and glial cells in the macrophages of the, uh, uh, the nervous system. They clean things up. Then the genome is silenced. So this is epigenetic control. And it can be silenced uh, by a variety of means, either by um, changes in histones that get placed on the chromosome or because of methylation. In the case of um, Epstein-Barr virus, we know that it's methylation. In the case of herpes simplex virus, I think it's still open to debate. But there are multiple copies of the virus genome. And then we see the accumulation of these latency-associated transcripts. And the other very peculiar thing about these transcripts is that they accumulate in the nucleus. So they are spliced mRNAs that accumulate in the nucleus and don't get exported out to the cytoplasm. And it could be that they're there because their role is to control expression of other virus transcripts. <coughs> so this is a picture of where the LATs originate from. And this is where the two regions of the virus chromosome meet. And the LATs go antisense to this protein that we talked about before, ICP0, which is a powerful transactivator, and ICP34.5, also known as gamma 30. 34.5, which is a neurovirulence gene. So if you make RNAs, and these are the microRNAs that are elaborated, that are uh, able to bind to these two gene products, you can imagine how that would shut off their effective translation. So that's all really hypothetical, though, because nobody's actually showed this in people for all the problems we have with getting um, people to donate organs. Um, so why neurons? Neurons don't replicate a divide, right? Remember we talked about DNA replication with herpes viruses and we said that there's a reason that the virus has a gene called thymidine kinase because neurons aren't busy making nucleotides for DNA synthesis because those cells don't divide. So that helps the genome establish and allows it to readily persist. What it doesn't explain is why there are 100 genomes in a uh, latently infected neuron. The nervous system is relatively insensitive to antivirals and immune surveillance because of the blood-brain barrier. Now, there are cells that will cross the blood-brain barrier, but whether or not they come in and replicate uh, and recognize infected cells is very unclear. And that's because these cells are not producing any virus antigens. So there's nothing to draw them there, all right? The signals that bring cells there to fight infection are not there. So the question that has puzzled me for longer than I want to admit is, how do they survive the primary infection? And I don't have the answer, but it's something you might want to solve or think about. And why are there multi multiple copies of virus DNA? These remain really two uh, enigmatic features of latently infected cells. Now, how do they reactivate? It turns out that in your neural ganglia you have millions of cells. Only a few of them are infected. And when the virus reactivates in response to something, only a few of those neurons actually produce new virus. Very few of them. And those viruses replicate their DNA. They make nucleocapsids and they go down the axon, they acquire membranes, and they go out and they infect the local epidermis that was enervated by that neuron. And that's how you get a blister. Surrounding neurons post-reactivation? Nothing. Occasionally you'll find people who, um, when infected with varicella zoster, talk about something called post-herpetic neuralgia. And that is, you've uh, develop shingles, which is the second coming of varicella, and then over a period of time it is cured or um, disappears, but you still have sensory deprivation in those areas, or you, you don't feel cold correctly, you don't feel hot correctly, and you have pain. And we believe that's a result of uh, infection of surrounding neurons. 
As I've told you before, many times reactivation is silent and virus is shed. And the question that remains is how is virus infection masked from the host immune response? And the only answer I have for that is that the antigens are just not displayed because the MHC presentation system is not that robust in neurons. What flips the switch? What takes those cells from latent infection to reactivation? Stress is a great uh, motivator of herpes virus infection, glucocorticoids. And in a model system, if you add this protein, you can reactivate. So ICP0, that powerful transcriptional activator to which the LATs go antisense, will do it. Now, the th problem that persists is in order to activate simplex infection, you need this protein, BP16. Remember, that's the protein that comes in with a virion particle. Well, there are no virion particles in a latently infected cell. So how does it initiate infection? And that's a conundrum. This is just a summary of um, the infection process. And you have your primary infection, where you express in a temporally regulated cascade faction immediate early, early and late genes, and you make new virus progeny. Those new virus progeny in the epithelium can now go and infect dendrites, the ends of uh, the axons, the neurons, and something happens. Even though they have this activator of immediate early gene expression, these viruses can now, once in the neuron, establish latent infection. And that gets maintained for your life. We don't cure it. We never get rid of it. And in fact, after you die, if you pull people's uh, ganglion out at post, and you look in those ganglia, the virus reactivates. It's looking for a way out. It's very cool, sort of. And these latently infected ganglia can reactivate and go back and start that infection process all over again. Now, difference between herpes simplex virus and varicella zoster virus, all right, chicken pox and shingles, those are two manifestations of varicella primary infection, reactivated infection. And there's a reasonably efficient vaccine for simplex and a reasonably efficient vaccine that's given to adults uh, 55 and over now to prevent shingles. <clears throat> and the thought is that it's the time between your first infection when you're a little guy and 55, which is pretty much the life of a memory B cell. And that's why you uh, boost the immune system. Primary infection, much like, cytomegalo blah, 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 much like cytomegalovirus, occurs through conjunctiva and upper respiratory tract. And you get sort of a stuffy, cold kind of a guy, and you infect all of uh, the lymphoid organs in the tract. And that results in a primary viremia. Primary viremia, spread of virus from that first infection, goes to organs in the body, liver, spleen, and whatever, where it replicates again. And then there's a second viremia. And it's the second viremia that seeds uh, the chicken pox. Uh, how many of you have actually had chicken pox? Oh, good. All right. So you know when you got it, like there was one little pox, and then there were two little pox, then there were three, and then there were 500. All right. <laughs> and they go all over your body. And they're not, um, it's not a synchronous infection, but rather it occurs in, uh, over a period of eight to 10 days. And then the virus goes and does what herpes simplex does enters through the dendrites, up the neurons, and establishes residency in the neural ganglia. So now onto something a little more complicated, and that's Epstein-Barr virus. I told you before that most of us are seropositive. We carry the genome. It's in your lymphocytes. I can take your lymphocytes. I can culture them. I can make virus. Every single one of you, or almost every single one of you. Um, the virus is residing in memory B lymphocytes on a long-term basis. And it's the causal agent of all these diseases. Now think about this. Infectious mononucleosis, also called kissing disease, transmitted by saliva. And there are two reasons for that. First, the virus can actually come out through the epithelial cells, and also because there are a certain number of lymphocytes that actually move out through your gums that are infected. Hodgkin's lymphoma is exactly that. It's a lymphoma. It's caused by Epstein 
bar virus, a certain kind of Hodgkin's. It's very treatable, which is nice. Nasopharyngeal carcinoma is an epithelial cell cancer. And Burkitt's lymphoma is a lymphoma, as I said to you before, that's common in uh, Central Africa. So we don't know why the virus causes each of these infections. But what I can tell you is that there are different arrays of virus proteins that are elaborated in these states. <sighs> EBV can come in and establish either a primary infection by infecting resting B cells, naive B cells. Then it elaborates a bunch of antigens, some of which are seen by cytotoxic and natural killer cells, eliminating some of these cells. And the cells that survive only manifest a few viral gene products. It can also establish a persistent infection by finding the right B cell host. And instead of undergoing a lytic infection, it will undergo a latent infection. And now the virus is there as a big chromosome, big episomal chromosome. When the virus DNA comes in, it's unmethylated. So virus DNA in virions has no methyl groups on it. Methylation is a way of epigenetically controlling gene expression. So promoters that are involved in uh, transcribing or are required for transcribing viral DNA and genes in the host that are methylated, also known as CPG islets, are frequently not expressed. You have to remove those marks of methylation to allow them to be expressed. The virus infects and expresses a gene called ZTA, which is an immediate early gene. And that's great. It's a very powerful activator of transcription, except for one thing. ZTA only actually works on methylated DNA. So this gene product is important in activating the virus or in reactivating the virus from latent infection into productive infection. So as the virus chromosome becomes methylated, you would think that ZTA could work, but it doesn't because it has a very short half-life. So it's expressed as a burst immediately after infection. It has no targets because the chromosome is not methylated. And as the chromosome becomes methylated, its half-life is short. Why is that? Because when you methylate the ZTA promoter, it doesn't get expressed. So there's a very closely controlled dynamic between the states of methylation that allows for expression of this gene product. Now, in latently infected B cells, the virus chromosome is a self-replicating episome, replicating in concert with the cell that it infects. It associates with nucleosomes, so it looks like chromatin, just a big circle of about 160,000 base pairs. It's methylated at CPG residues, and that's what keeps it from being expressed to some extent. A limited repertoire of virus genes are expressed, however, and that's because they have promoters that are recognized by some of the products of the virus uh, genome and also by host proteins. These infected cells home to bone marrow and lymphoid organisms, and I'll show you that in a minute, and they're not seen by CTLs or virus-specific antibody because the proteins that are made, something called latent membrane protein, only elaborates a tiny, tiny bit of its face. It's a huge protein, but it runs in a serpentine fashion through the membrane so, such that there are very, very small epitopes that are revealed on the cell surface, and they tend not to be recognized. And virions are rarely produced. In fact, what we know is that cells that make EBV um, viruses are plasma cells. Those are the same cells that make antibody. And they happen to be a wonderful way of immortalizing human um, cells from which you want to produce human antibodies. So this is the EBV uh, latency program as we understand it. The virus comes in. It infects naive resting B cells. These cells get stimulated in response to a bunch of uh, cell surface markers and their recognition by other cells. And a number of EBV gene products are made. Don't memorize that. These cells migrate, okay, to germinal centers. And they undergo 
kind of differentiation. They expand. And that expansion triggers a different program of latency. The virus is now replicating in concert with the host. It's not making virus particles. So there's only a limited number of virus genes that are being transcribed, but virus DNA gets replicated. These cells undergo somatic hypermutation, affinity maturation, and isotype switching. That's what B cells do. That's how they make antibody. And they do it containing Epstein-Barr virus. A certain number of these cells become memory B cells, and they are the long-term reservoir for Epstein-Barr virus. So that's, you know, that's a 50-year vacation, or can be. Some of these cells become plasma cells, and it's in plasma cells where the virus um, is readily reactivated, and once the virus is reactivated, it can go back and infect your naive resting B cells. So it's a constant process of infection, reinfection at low levels, and a small percentage of your B cells are infected all the time. Now, let's look at this, but not really carefully, because I only want to point out a couple of things. Um, this is the Epstein-Barr virus genome in a cell. It's a circle. It's important to know that there is an origin for plasmid replication. There's also an origin for lytic replication. So there are two different origins for DNA synthesis. The proteins that are marked here, LMP, EBNA, two, uh, I can't find three, three, and one, are basically the proteins that are expressed in latently infected cells. What's very amusing is that you start up here and you read through this region and you make an RNA that gets spliced 100 kilobases away to make this protein EBNA1. All latently infected uh, cells of the EBV express EBNA1 and EBNA1 can control its own expression. It's very important in regulating um, chromosome replication and it will uh, serve to activate and select for expression of EBNA2, EBNA3, and LMP. So there's this crazy regulation of genes talking with each other, and they're involved in both transcriptional control and genome replication. So what happens when a B cell divides? The chromosome has to replicate to be distributed to the daughter cell. That makes sense. I told you that there were two origins of replication. <laughs> One for lytic infection, making new linear DNA molecules, which is how the virus is present in a, uh, a virion. That's a linear DNA molecule. And then using REP for episomal replication, like plasmids and bacteria. The difference is the effectiveness with which these origins are recognized. So for lytic infection, Lytic infection, you get high copy number, thousands of genomes per cell. And for late infection, eh, you pretty much get one or two. So very low levels of um, expression. What controls it? Well, the viral chromosome episomal, nucleosome coded, we've talked about that. And now you synchronize it with the host. Why? Because you want an even division. You are a virus. Your goal is to get to the next step and at some point make more of yourself and not kill the cell. If you make too much DNA in a cell, you will trigger a DNA damage response. That will cause the cell to react, activate the DNA damage response mechanisms, P53 and whatever, and cause the cell to apoptose. So that's not a good thing. One of the things that we know is that there are host proteins that are bound at the origin of this plasma. They're called CDC6 and CDT1. And they, in concert with EBNA, interact to form an origin recognition complex. And that is a stable feature that sits on the origin of replication of episomally replicating EBV. And this really, really complicated slide will be simplified, I hope, in a couple of seconds. What happens is that in G1, this origin replication complex is established. So you have EBNA1, and you have CDC6 and CDT1. That prevents replication. But this is a stable complex 
until sometime in G1, the protein MCM1 is made, and that causes a pre-replication complex to establish. And so now this is something that's sitting here at the boundary of G1 and S, ready to be replicated, but it still has these inhibitory proteins on it. The cell, early in S, produces a protein called geminin. And what geminin does is act as a sink to capture CDT1 and remove it from the origin replication complex. When CDT1 is removed, CDC6 comes off. And when it's not bound, it gets phosphorylated and degraded. So now you have a complex that's ready to replicate DNA, and that uses the normal host DNA polymerase machinery. It replicates in an S, and then <coughs> uh, the cells cycle through S into G2, and CDT1 carrying, uh, or geminin carrying CDT1 follows through until M, where geminin is released. And that allows CDT1 to bind back onto this origin of replication, and CDC6 is made at the same time, and we're back in this cycle. So this elaborate control network that utilizes host and virus proteins controls the number of replication cycles that the virus can undergo, and it usually only goes, undergoes one or two. So EBV replicates in synchrony with the host. Replication is licensed by the formation of an origin replication complex. It recruits other proteins, such as MCM1, which releases the viral genome, and that allows for initiation of virus DNA replication. I told you that late in S, geminin is produced, and that sequesters CDT1. It's subsequently degraded in G2. That frees CDT1 to reassociate with the origin, and you get no second round of replication because during S and G2, these two proteins are destroyed. So they're not available to initiate a second round. Now the other virus I wanted to tell you about is a beta herpes virus, and that's HHV6. And it's very unique. It's very unique because while it causes this uh, rather benign infection of young children, uh, it persists for the life of the host, and it persists by integrating into telomeres of a chromosome. And it does that because the ends of this chromosome, let's call it the right end and the left end, depending upon how you're standing, okay, these have strong homology to sequences that are present in telomeres. And if you'll recall from your cell biology, telomeres contain repeated units of DNA. And it's these repeated units of DNA that serve as a site for recombination and integration of the virus chromosome. And by integrating into the virus chromosome, it's easy for this virus to replicate. It replicates every time the cell replicates its own genetic information. And it's possible to reactivate this. And when it reactivates, it actually excises from the chromosome. So the thing you want to remember is that each end of this virus genome is now contiguous with sequences present in host telomeres. <coughs> Let's talk about human papillomaviruses. Um, they're really pretty amazing. There are about 150 different types. And they get, you know, it's not frogs that cause warts, it's papillomaviruses. And they do it in a very interesting fashion by causing cells in the epidermis to proliferate. Sometimes those proliferations are benign, and sometimes they're malignant. And the type, of the, the type of proliferation that occurs is based on whether it's a high or a low risk virus type. So viruses come in uh, four flavors. They either affect, infect mucocutaneous epidermis or cutaneous epidermis. And within each of those types, there are viruses that are either high or low risk types. Low risk viruses cause relatively benign lesions. You still get a wart, doesn't spread, rarely doesn't become malignant. High risk types cause aberrant cell replication and division and can lead to carcinoma. And they are the cause of cervical carcinoma, ovarian carcinoma, um, some vulvar and penile lesions. We also believe that they have a role in laryngeal 
papilloma formation. So uh, what do they do? All right. What happens is they enter the skin through a tear and they infect the basal layer of differentiating epithelium. Remember, epithelium grows up and it grows out. And the basal cells are stem cells of a type. They proliferate for the life of the individual. If you infect one, it's there for good. And they replicate as episodes as the cells divide. Now, as cells divide in the epithelium, they get pushed up through the stratum. And what you have is a differentiation program of epithelia. And it's this differentiating program that provides different uh, transcriptional factors for the virus to replicate. So the virus is uh, phasing its replication with the host's division. Replicating virus genomes only occur in terminally differentiated epithelium cells. So those are the cells that are just below the layer of keratinized epithelium before they slough off. And they can be full of virus, and they're actually uh, quite infectious. And they interrupt the program of ter terminal differentiation when they express these two virus early gene products, E6 and E7. And they're, cause, they're called the transforming genes of uh, papillomavirus. And here's a picture of your developing epithelium. <coughs> your infection is down in the basal layer. Virus replicates DNA to a limited extent. And as the virus, as these infected cells are pushed up and they mature and they differentiate, more virus genomes are made and virus late proteins are synthesized. Virus late proteins are only synthesized in fully differentiated epithelium. The virus replicates its DNA using two proteins. E1 and E2. They're both homodimers. E2 is a DNA binding protein. It recognizes a very specific site on the virus chromosome by its origin, and it brings E1 to that site. E1 has helicase activity. It opens up that virus genome and allows for propagation of DNA from its origin of replication. Finally, E2 is dissociated. More E1 is recruited to expand the growing replication fork. How do papillomaviruses persist? Well, here's an interesting um, picture of what goes on. These are infected epithelium looking at two different populations of virus gene products. The early gene products, and you see that they're made mostly at the basal epithelium, right at the region where the epithelium um, attaches to the dermis. So you have epidermis or dermis. It's those basal layers. When you look for late gene products, they're only present in that fully differentiated tissue. So there, again, this emphasizes the defined program that separates early from late replication and is controlled by the differentiation process of the cell. When papillomaviruses persist in carcinomas, they integrate their genome. They don't pop out, though. And part of their problem is that they integrate usually within the late regions and that prevents new virus proteins from being made, but allows for expression of these three gene products, E6, E7, and E5, that are important in transforming. These two guys interact with host proteins, such as P53 and RB, sequester them, and change uh, the replication protein, the replication pattern of affected cells. And E5 acts with a cell receptor to trigger um, a new wave of transcription. Now, uh, the last topic I want to dwell on is human polyomaviridae, and there are six members of this family. Most of them don't cause very much disease, but in immune-suppressed individuals, it's clear that these viruses can reactivate and cause either development of tumors or severe um, and neurological uh, disease. So um, the only virus that's associated with a human tumor is MCV, which stands for Merkel cell uh, virus, and it's associated with a kind of carcinoma called Merkel cell carcinoma. And the rest of the human papillomaviruses appear to latently infect humans, either in kidneys or in neurons. But what we do know is from patients who have a multiple sclerosis, there's been a great drug that was made, which is an antibody that suppresses in part the immune system, and it's called Tisabri. And in these individuals, and it's a rare number of them, uh, the drug is fabulous. It helps to relieve the symptoms. But they frequently uh, get a disease 
which is called PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. And this results from reactivation of a human polyomavirus. Normally the virus is quiet, you never see it, we never knew it was there. But in these individuals who are on this immunosuppressive regime, which helps them with multiple sclerosis, they have a much higher than normal occurrence of the disease. It's not 50%, it's not 20%, it's not 10%, but you know, if, if you're the 5% that gets it, or, or whatever the number is, it's, it's a big decision to make as to whether or not you're going to take this drug. Um, you're going to die from the MS, and this is going to give you a chance. So it's, it's not a crapshoot, but it is a problem. Um, Vince made this comment three years ago in his blog. Given the high seroprevalence of polyoma viruses in humans, it's not unexpected that we see disease manifested. And it was really a very, very, um, um, it was a terrifically um, prescient statement because it was shortly after that that the Merkel cell virus was identified and we saw these patients respond to Tisabri in this way. So um, you can give them credit for that. This is what the Merkel cell virus genome looks like. You can't read it, and there's a reason for that. All I want to point out to you is that it makes T antigen just like the SV40 virus that we talked about. It serves the same purpose. It's important for replication of the virus. It's important for replication from the origin. It controls transcription. But what's really amazing about this is that when the virus causes cancer, it integrates into a cell. It's a monoclonal disease, so it doesn't result from multiple virus infection rather than a single virus infection that results in proliferation of those cells, monoclonal. We know that from looking at the integration sites. But in all cases where it integrates, the T antigen is mutated. And because it's mutated, those viruses can't replicate. They can't pop out of the chromosome. You can, however, take a Merkel cell carcinoma, uh, Merkel cell carcinoma cell line, add wild type T antigen from the Merkel cell, and actually get those chromosomes to pop out and make virus. Okay, so I told you about clonal integration. I told you about this, and that for the most part, integrated virus genomes are not excised cells survive, and they cause this cancer, which is a rare uh, neuroectodermal cancer. Um, not terrific, but it can be treated. So let me sum up by reminding you that persistence is a result of viruses preferentially targeting slowly dividing cells. It's the best place to get a start for the virus. They adopt a variety of survival strategies, either hide from the host, suppress the host's immune system, replicate with the host, be there so that the opportunity when it occurs for them to replicate again is there. And in response to a variety of stimuli, these latent genes can on occasion reactivate. 